Welcome to Friday Morning's Devotions as we continue working our way through this amazing chapter 8 of the book of Romans. So today we're looking at the subject of future glory and looking at Romans 8 verses 18 to 30. So let's read that passage in now. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified amen now as we continue this section in Romans which speaks about salvation and something of the fruit of salvation and the life there is after salvation. It's it's building to a great crescendo indeed as it comes to this. We've been thinking about the, the life in the spirit. We think about how we're heirs of glory in the first part of this chapter. Now as we move on, first thing I want us to see here is the glory to be revealed, which is mentioned from verse 18 verse 25 and Paul is a, an amazing statement he's for he consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us and that was no casual statement by Paul Paul knew all about suffering he f went through some ter terrible experiences in this for the sake of the gospel but he says all that he suffered it's nothing compared to the glory that's going to come. And he speaks first of all here in this part about how creation groans for this in verses 19 to 20. It speaks of how creation has been subjected to a very frustrating circumstance because of the sin of Adam. Indeed, when Adam sinned, the whole world, all of creation became under God's curse. And so creation is groaning for that day when the sons of God will be Indeed, their salvation will be complete so that indeed they will be set free from this burden. And so as we think of salvation, salvation is not just about some people going to heaven. It's about the whole world, all of creation being changed into the new heaven and new earth, a new world, which will be absolutely glorious. So creation groans. But we also see in verse 23 to 25 that indeed believers groan as well. And believers groan, longing for the redemption of their bodies. Now, we need to understand this. And I think that I can say a couple of things. First of all, we struggle as Christians as long as we live in these bodies of sin. Uh, we seek to live the Lord, but it's these bodies of sin that pulls us down. We, we maybe want to read God's word and all of a sudden we get tired. There, there's something fleshly about our bodies which works against the, the ways of the Spirit. And so we long for the day when these bodies will be replaced by spiritual bodies, which are real solid physical bodies, but in line with the spirit and living in obedience for the Lord. 
But also we see here that redemption is not just about your soul. Redemption is about the whole person. And we need to be careful that we don't, at times, diminish the importance of our bodies. We are human beings, body, mind and soul. Our bodies are, are much part of us as indeed our souls are. And we need to remember that. So the glory to be revealed, creation groans for this, believers groan for this. And then we have the Spirit's help in verses 26 to 27. And speaks there in this first verse how the Spirit helps us in our, our weakness as we live in this world, we will be weakened. It's crucial that we accept that and understand that we're vulnerable and weakened. We can only live the Christian life and be sustained through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit intercedes with groans too deep for words, it says there. The Holy Spirit sees the mess in us and groans to the Father for help and for grace. And so the Spirit, he goes on and speaks there in verse 27, the Spirit knows the mind of God. The Spirit indeed can pray for us according to God's will. Totally in tune, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, totally in harmony with each other. And so the Spirit helps us and just speaks of a, a work, a ministry that goes on beyond us. We have got the Father for Christians, the Father, the Son and the Spirit all on our side working for us. How amazing that is. And so we have the glory to be revealed, the Spirit's help in our weakness. And then thirdly, we have this wonderful truth in verse 28. This wonderful verse, which I'm sure you all know. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. What a wonderfully reassuring verse that is. Now we need to be careful about it though. This verse doesn't apply for all people. It's not that everything will work out good for everyone in the end. It's for those who love God. For those who are right with God. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Didn't work out well for the rich man. He ended up in hell. So it's not as if everything's going to just work out well for everyone. It's only for those who love God. Now it's not saying that all things that come into our lives are good. But what it's saying is God works and causes all things to become for our good. As they work together. It's not just necessary individual things are for our good. God causes all things to work together. God works at this. It doesn't naturally happen that things will be for our good. God works things out. Things which are meant for evil. Think the story of Joseph and his brothers meant it for evil. God, God meant it for good. God works things out. Turns the schemes of the devil, the schemes of wicked people, even our own stupidity and failings. He turns them around in the end to work for the good of those who love God. And then the final thing on this passage, and oh, we could stand, spend several sermons in each of these sections here today. But the final thing is the golden chain in verses 29 to 30. And that's what the Puritans called it. He speaks of those who God foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. The golden chain which can never be broken. Those who are at the beginning will end up at the end. You can't fall out. Of this chain halfway along. Let's think of those five phrases to just to be clear of what they mean. Those he foreknew means he set his love upon in eternity, choosing them to be his. Uh, to know in the Bible, in the King James, in the Genesis, talks about Adam knowing Eve, it speaks of that intimate love, that intimate relationship. God to foreknow, he set his love upon certain people, choosing them to be his own in eternity. Then he predestined them. Oh, that raises hackles, doesn't that word? But look what he says about predestination here. Predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. So those who he sets his love upon, choosing and turning, those who he foreknows, he predestined, he designs that they would be changed into the likeness of his son. That's his plan for them. That's his purpose for them. So those he's going to change into the likeness of his son, he calls. The Bible really has two calls. There's an outward call of the gospel which goes to all who hear it. And then there's the inward, factual call of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about here. 
Those who are called by the Spirit, it's the effectual call. It's effective. It changes the heart of the sinner. It transforms the heart of the sinner. It's the power of God changing them, causing them. Not causing them against their will, but as James Durham said, sweetly determining their will. So they will embrace Christ. And so those who embrace Christ, those who are called and embrace Christ in faith, they're justified. Declared to be right with God. To be innocent before God. Not because they're good, but because of Jesus. His righteousness is applied as they trust in him. So they're justified and then they're glorified. And now, think about this. This is in the past tense. It's as if Paul is saying, it's as good as done. I'm putting it in the past tense. Because it will happen. God will lose none of his own. Glorified. Think of what 1 John 3 talks about. When we see him, we shall be like him. Changed into the likeness of Christ. Wow. Entering the glory of heaven. Perfect. Glorious. To worship our God forever. The golden chain. Those who he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. Oh, what a wonderful thing. It shows us here that salvation is all of God. All of grace.